OK. So good morning. Um, before starting, today we will speak about uh, multimodal interfaces and multimodal interaction. And, but that is, let's say, a theoretical part still. And before starting, just a couple of um, observation, let me say. So the first thing that I would like to, to tell you is something that happened this morning to me, just an, as another example of a, a user interface that could have been designed better than uh, it was. And it, it's not about the Polytechnic of Torino this time, but uh, it's about this. This is the software we are using for you know, recording, video recording the lecture. And this morning I open it and I put the logo here and all this thing. And then I try it. And here you see that there is a, a bar that is connected to the microphone. Uh, so if I speak, uh, this bar change. But this morning, this bar didn't work, basically. So the microphone working for, for my operating system, but here this doesn't work. So if I with the recorder anything, my, the audio was not recorded. And the user interface basically stayed the same. So I have no cue on why this is not working. The program works correctly. It doesn't give any observation, any warning, any, anything about why the microphone doesn't work. From the operating system point of view, the microphone worked, but from this, doesn't. So in other programs, the microphone worked, but here not. And so this could have been better design uh, because the problem here was that the application didn't ask the operating system for the permission to use the microphone. So the operating system doesn't give the permission, the application doesn't ask for the permission, and we get stuck in that loop, and so the microphone doesn't work. This was evident after a very quick search on Google, but it was really uh, just some hints could have been provided here, just that we have a problem communicating with the operating system, check the settings, for instance, and so on. So, and this is a, a beta version of the software. So I hope uh, that we will survive this, that the video survives this hour and the half. Just another example. Well, I, will t I told you before, today we are speaking about multimodal interaction. Uh, this is, uh, as you notice, we basically stop speaking about the process. You are following the process in the lab, but we are not uh, uh, speaking in class about the process. Yesterday you uh, have seen uh, visual design with Professor Corno. Um, today we are moving on multimodal interaction. Next week we will start speaking about voice, also from a more technical part, uh, from a technical point of view. And we will basically have done most of the steps of the process, from need finding to prototyping, to heuristics and guidelines, we will need to cover the evaluation, user testing, a user study as evaluation part, and we will do it in uh, a few weeks. Uh, but now we would like to focus also to allow you to start implementing your prototype on the other theoretical part, and next week on the voice-based um, modality interaction that we will start to see here today. Um, and this is the second thing. The third thing that I would like to, to tell you, and I would try to have some question to you in this presentation, during this lecture, uh, because here there are not a lot of concepts, but a lot of examples, and a lot of things that we can spend probably weeks in understanding and reasoning and discussing. So without spending weeks, but maybe neither five minutes, uh, good to compromise. So I will have some question for you and hopefully you have some answer back to, for me. So multimodal interaction, what uh, <coughs> do you think is multimodal? And this is the first question. And 
I will give you a let's say formal definition about it, but what do you think from the name multimodal interface? What is this modal? Anyone? different ways of interacting uh, <coughs> such as let's make some voice example and voice and yeah and writing for instance yes it's different putting together different uh, let's say <coughs> some first informal definition putting together different uh, way of interaction interaction in a user interface mm -hmm. this mimics the human beings we are let's say multimodal by by default by definition Right now I am looking at you and you hopefully are looking here and I'm also speaking and I, before I was listening the answer all together I am also uh, making some gesture and uh, I'm also hearing people that speak outside so we, we all do this normally, typically and as human beings we rely to do this on our vision hearing uh, are our senses and here more or less the same uh, we can leverage our senses and the equivalent and modality that emerge from our senses with computers and right now you have all c1 that is the most used uh, in the user interfaces of this modality that is uh, yesterday you did a lecture about uh, the title visual design mm -hmm. because visual vision is one of the most used uh, not only senses as human being we mostly rely on vision mm -hmm. and secondly on auditory feedback third uh, more or less with uh, touch and smell and finally a lot of finally at the end also on taste we typically don't put things, random things, in our mouth um, with no reason. Um, so this is more or less multimodal uh, interaction. So about multimodal. So what we should know right now, just to put everybody on the same page. So we know that it's important that you tested it during the process in your projects to design for the user and to follow a human-centered process. We also know, or we are discovering, that, uh, uh, let's say, people are a mess. So, because people are really different from each other, they may have different abilities, different weaknesses, not only physical, but also moral or cultural, they can come from different backgrounds and culture. They have different interests. Somebody is interested in soccer. Uh, somebody uh, likes uh, the Juventus, somebody not. And so they have different viewpoints, different experiences. Uh, some, you are here listening live this lecture. Uh, since this course has around 80 people, most of them are not here, so probably they will see the video lecture on public. So there are different viewpoints about things, different experience, different attitudes. They have obviously are different ages and size. Hmm? A children interacting with, for instance, where a computer is very different from uh, elderly people. They have different needs, hmm? uh, different capability for instance, a and so on. We can continue this list uh, as long as we like, but these are, let's say, the main things that we can summarize in people are a mess, in a good way, uh, let's say, because people are really different. And, and all these things have an impact, obviously, on how we can have a software application useful, used, and usable for uh, a person mm? and indeed also on whether they can use a software application or not mm? if we for instance rely only on the visual 
uh, component of an application and then we have a person who is blind probably this person cannot use at all that application without any tool without any support without anything else than our totally 100 percent visual application and so <clears throat> the first question here is that is not for you this time is how we can if it's possible to generalize all of this to say we design for a general person a prototype of a person that takes into account all of this or most of this so different abilities physical or not different backgrounds culture interest uh, preferences hmm? or, or not we should design for every single um, portion of a population uh, with well identified for this or we can also think about designing for a general more general population hmm? and the answer is yes we should so obviously it's easier and we probably partially experimented we ask you to, to do this to design for a specific population because it's easier hmm? uh, to design something for let's say students uh, in a certain range of age at Politecnico uh, from Italy and so on it's, it's easier than design for everybody but we should take into account in our software in our application also some principle some ideas some guidelines that stem from universal design or design for all that the definition of this universal design is designing interactive system that are usable by anyone with any range of abilities and using any technology platform these are three elements of this universal design these are goals very high level goals so usable by anyone no matter if it's a, chi child, a, chi a child that is less than one meter height or uh, a person with in a wheelchair and using any technology platform that we have so this is a very wide definition again very high level that applies to software application that apply to design uh, user interfaces with computers but also in, in the real world in the material world for the, say the architectural part of things and how we can move towards universal design well I, i've written here two things and then maybe you can imagine and tell me another things so the first one is i have a redundancy of information and modalities so for instance i can have an information provided visually and also vocally so that the same information is delivered at the right time in both way so if i can listen i will receive the information the important information if i can see i will see the information and if i'm not a lot of things on the screen that i'm looking at this uh, information that i heard could be also useful for me even if i can see everything i have no problem with my eyes and so this is a redundancy the same information provided in a different way maybe not all active together maybe you can personalize that but the application should support a redundancy of information through different means to example again as before visual and speech for instance for providing a notification the other way is to be compatible with assistive technologies do you know if i say assistive technology do you have any an example of what what is an assistive technology do you know what is an assistive technology Siri is not necessarily assistive. Yeah, it's it's it, it assists uh, maybe it try to assist people, but uh, it's not really an assistive technology in that sense. Do, yes, yesterday Professor Corno speak about uh, eye tracker. 
if you are if you were here uh, we, we will see them after that could be used as an assistive technology to allow people who cannot move to control a computer by eyes by looking at things if you are blind an assistive technology for the computer is a screen reader something that read what happens in the screen so that you can interact with a computer so uh, obviously this technology may require some changes in your application because if you are creating a point and click application with very small button that are perfectly fine to be used with a mouse and then you have to imagine this application to be used uh, by a tracker you will never nowadays you will never re reach a precision with an eye tracker the same precision that we have in pointing very very closely to the target with a mouse like with touch screens you have button bigger than with mouse because you have a larger sur surface for clicking. Uh, screen reader in a web application, unfortunately, a lot of web applications are not uh, usable, totally usable uh, with a screen reader. Because for instance, developers or content management system don't, or users, uh, writers, don't add, uh, let's say the alternative text for an image so a screen reader cannot read an image because it has no information about the image so he needs that people add some textual information about the image so if a website has an alternative text attached to an image the screen reader can describe the image to the user that is blind and cannot see the image and this could be done manually or automatically so for instance facebook uh, generates automatically uh, alt text for most of their images through machine learning techniques and by leveraging on other alt text inserted by the user mm. uh, another example twitter instead ask users to add the alt text for an image if you if they want so it's not automatic but the person have to add the alt text in a website, typically it's the developer or the writer on that website that have to add the alt text so its images. And other idea, at least one, came to my mind yesterday uh, to support this uh, universal design in a, let's say, a software application. That is not redundancy, so no, yeah, redundancy is fine, but in your answer it cannot be redundancy so no multimodal or multiple interaction obviously not necessarily compatible with assistive technologies if you think hmm, about for instance cultures and backgrounds what may come to your mind It, it may have a suggestion, whatever in mind, it may have to do with uh, reading and the fact that we are writing from one side to the other while other population not. So, so this is basically the answer, but translate the application. Yeah, provide different uh, uh, languages for the application could be uh, a way to to support universal design if you are targeting a, a general uh, population so if you are designing the next uh, uh, windows operating system probably you you cannot do it only in italian um, yeah another next to that yeah um, more or less. Mm. Let's say having, yeah. It's more about good design, providing the right content at the right time, uh, suggesting next, the next thing to do. They're not 
really universal design. Um, so for instance, the, the other thing is support different languages, not only languages, but support also different, uh, yeah, a subset of that. Uh, languages we write from left to right but other population write uh, vice versa from uh, right to left and so we we need to support not only the translation but also uh, the alignment of the text we cannot align everything to the left because they read in from the other side so we need to have interfaces that are able not only able to shift the text from one side of the other but also to do it uh, in a proper way so that it looks like it was native not a we we take this that was designed on the left and put that on the right where maybe there is another element it, it's a real thinking about where to put text so if you have a text and a button i cannot simply put the text on on the other side or over the button or under the button because yeah this is a translation but it's not suitable for uh, a user interface design. Uh, obviously, universal design has some principle. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> the idea in universal design is that you don't design for, again, some specific population to improve the life of people on wheelchair, but you design for really everybody. So that anything that is useful for a person on a wheelchair is also useful for a person that walk, uh, typically walking. Mm -hmm. and, and these are the seven interaction design principles. Mm -hmm. So the first one, some of that are not really applicable to software application, like low physical effort. Maybe with some hardware, with a computer system, it may apply, but if you just design a software application, a low physical effort is, is something that you can maybe avoid to have a long pressing of a button or something like that, but it's, it's, it's quite rare to apply that to um, a, a software application. Also seven could be difficult to be applied. Other, tolerance for error, uh, flexibility, simplicity and intuitiveness uh, perceptible information are instead of applicable uh, here there is a link with a website with a description of that or a longer description of these seven principles but you may recognize that for instance they speak about tolerance for error and be able to uh, recover from error was also a guideline a principle that you have seen uh, some weeks ago simple intuitiveness simplicity intuitiveness also so they are obviously compatible with that principle and that principle probably if you are able to apply 100 percent that principle you probably also apply that so these universal design principle are really principle that respond to that one and enable you to create a good design in any case so if you think about it, if you think about the principle that you realized before, probably you also met most of that. And just to, I would like to skip the principle one by one. I would like to, to have some example. Again, I put here a couple of examples. So if you have the slides, you see the example. Um, but think about something that apply the universal design principle uh, maybe in the physical world that it is easier than not um, on a computer system and uh, share with the class let's say one thing well one thing is in the slide but you don't look at it one thing was in the in the previous slide One thing that is designed, that is beneficial for maybe people with disability, but you also may benefit about it. Yeah, maybe not. So you, you can try to, to use a website with a screen reader if you want. 
so you can understand why the, the, the web is quite bad to, today for that but typically I, I cannot use the screen reader to, to navigate that, but do you think it's easier if you imagine something in the real world in the uh, physical automatic world door. automatic door sliding door automatic door yeah elevators, elevators. Um, elevators well-designed elevators yeah <laughs> um, sliding doors are obviously now for instance respect equitable use but also respect this low physical effort because you just move and the door open and so if you are a person on a wheelchair this is great because you don't have to reach the handle and the door open but if you break your leg so you are temporary disable a disabled person for a temporary this is also useful for you if you make groceries and you have a lot of things to bring home this is also useful because the door is opening and you don't have to understand it, whether you have to press and push the door and with how we need to put down things and so on um, elevators just to, to avoid uh, stairs obviously are a good support also this what, what is this yes yes <laughs> it, it, it's a, a rampa uh, <laughs> yeah it's a ramp that is it is is a good example when it's present for a universal design because you know this is obviously you may imagine that is fought for who yeah wheelchair users mm. obviously but if you have a children in a um, <laughs> okay you, you you got it uh, the <laughs> it's also easier mm, to to get out get, get on the or if you again have uh, break your leg it's easier to to walk over there and also you do you notice these lines there so these are these lines there other kind of car, uh, carb ramp are uh, with other um, things just, just not plain as a surface but as some bump or something like that these are for people who are blind so that they can understand that they are moving and then there is a change in the street and also that is converging uh, towards uh, there is a, a ramp so they cannot see but they can with the they can sense that there is something changed not anymore the street the asphalt but there is this ramp this car and when it finish so it it's it's simple we we see a lot of that in in the city and it's it's universal design when it's well done because it's useful for typically working people with people with motor disabilities either temporary or permanent with people who are blind or low vision it it's and it, it's simple it it doesn't use any particular strange technology or just a ramp with some lines well studied well designed but it's it's really simple this is a good example when it's present a universal design um, and this is another example you don't obviously you don't know what is this and um, I have a video So you cannot you you don't have the this video as also an audio this is a net tracker and this is a, a multimodal interface in which well again this is a multimodal interface for control a smart home uh, basically in which the user it's looking at the uh, its house her house his house and it's looking at some device so a shutter for instance and 
by looking at things it can control hmm, the, the environment and this is multimodal for, for two reasons because and it's let's say universal design in that sense because this is usable with mouse and keyboard this uh, produce sounds when an action is performed if you look at, at this at home it say the shutter on the kitchen is turning on it also give a, a feedback and also right here in this area here a notification that say the same thing so there is this redundancy of information and it's also touch based you can touch this button they are bigger enough to touch that and it's also eye tracker so through the gaze you can control things so this is an application that you can use on your computer uh, you can use it on a tablet for instance uh, you can use with uh, an eye tracker you can use successfully without losing information without losing possibility and action with any um, with a lot of different um, modalities and senses mm -hmm. uh, this is yeah we will see other eye tracker later on this is a quite old uh, eye tracker and this is a quite old project it was made in 2011 um, and it's a research prototype it's not a product uh, it was uh, fought for people uh, which suffer of uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis mm? SLA in, Italia, in Italian mm? because these people progressively lose control of their body so at the beginning they can touch things so they can use that but they more and more lose control on their body and the last thing that they lose control is the eye so with uh, an application like this they can control and communicate with people in their home just in a lot of stages of their of, of, of the of the disease mm -hmm. okay these are just two examples the other two that you made are good enough are good and, and this brings us to multimodal interaction we have seen in these two examples before that they are redundant in information the software application provides a lot of speech uh, voice yes speech um, gaze uh, touch uh, movements mouse and keyboards to control that and vision to see what happens also the, the ramp the carb uh, as something for people that are blind because they can understand where they are and how to, to overcome that also people with a wheelchair so with some motor here let's say motor uh, disabilities and also for people that are typically walking in different stages of their life or activities so this is multimodal interaction is a way to answer to some of the principle to some of the criteria about universal design or redundancy for for all uh, absolutely so the definition let's say the formal definition of multimodal interaction that is quite close to, to the one that you you told me before is to use more than one sensory channel or mode of interaction so you can use together in application vision that is a sense uh, taste maybe that is a sense uh, touch like skin hmm? that is a sense uh, hearing and smell and these are the five senses that you we all know but we can also have a multimodal application that use gaze hmm? so the eyes to look at some element on the screen and produce some action the voice to speak to speak obviously you don't speak with um, uh, your tongue out but it's it's just a picture and i didn't find anything better and with gesture hmm? that are not only with hands but it could be full body gesture like touch is not only with hand hmm? you can also understand if someone is touching your arm 
because it's the skin that provides you this sense. And also hearing sound, speech that you receive or the computer produce and smell. So obviously, as I told you before, we as human beings made a lot of usage of vision and gaze um, and hearing. These are the two most used for us senses. And then we understand a lot of things about the environment we touch. And as Italian, we do a lot of gestures. And smell is also important for understanding the environment, not used a lot like vision or hearing, but it's used in our environment, while ta taste is obviously uh, less used by us. So the idea of multimodal interaction is to have some of these, all of these, or just a couple of these, it depends, uh, in providing interaction with a computer system and in providing interaction with a user interface, in enabling a user interface to use more than one of these, for instance, again, to provide redundancy of information. Uh, so, in your idea, can we use all of these in a user interface? And which of these are less used uh, in a user interface, in a say, multimodal user interface? So, let's. Uh, First question, can we use all of these together? Maybe not. Okay, it sounds it sound reasonable. Um, which are the most used? Vision is absolutely the most used, it's predominant. In user interface, in human computer interaction right now, I would say the 99% of interaction happens via vision. That is not a perfect match with what we experience in our life, in which also hearing has a great importance for us. This is not, this is a sort of mismatch. Uh, but obviously vision is our main uh, uh, way to get information, and so this was widely used and we basically speak about vision up to today in this course. Uh, so vision is the most used, the, the second most used in your opinion? Hearing voice. How many of you say hearing? Hearing slash voice? No, some of you say hearing. Okay, and instead touch, touch, okay, uh, touch is, so re in reality touch is, 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 is the sense of touching, it's not this, hmm? okay, it's not touching uh, on a screen, hmm? this is more gesture, but yeah, we can use that as synonyms right now, hmm? okay, yeah, more or less, and in your opinion, uh, smell is used? No. And taste? No. We will see that for smell is not totally true, but is uh, absolutely smell and taste are the least used uh, senses and mode of interaction in human computer interaction. And okay, so multimodal interface around us as yeah. Yeah. We can say that, for instance, vision is uh, it's our input. Um, taste, touch, hearing, smell, same. Gaze, voice, and gesture are instead our output. Yeah. You can think about this when designing. Obviously, yes. So these are sensory. Ch this is because the definition has. Uh, to use more than one sensory channel or mode of interaction. So the sensory channels are our human input, vision, our senses, vision, taste, touch, hearing, and smell. And touch is this, skin. Hmm? Instead, the, the mode of interaction that are not 
human input, but more output, human output, let's say, is gaze. We can look somewhere. It's voice. We communicate with the voice and it's gesture. That again could be full body gesture, one hand gesture, head movement, just gesture. But yeah, absolutely. There are, I'll say, five input and three output for humans to explore and to combine together if we want. Um, so, uh, as we, we discover, uh, most interactive systems are predominantly visual. Mm? They are often WIMP-based. Uh, you, you remember or you know WIMP, what stands for? WIMP. W-U-I-M-P. For window, icons, menus, yeah, pointers. Windows, icon, menu, and pointers. Traditional operating system. Uh, so typically, most of the interface are obviously WIMP-based, and uh, uh, they use sound. They use hearing. They explore our hearing as an input for human by simple sound when you uh, empty the trash on your computer it makes a sound it's a feedback it's very simple feedback it's it's hearing when a message arrives on your smartphone a notification it, it makes a sound but are they predominantly visual and obviously a system become more complex, the visual channel may be overloaded if too much information is presented at once, so this could lead to frustration or error or to requires high training. So I don't know if you remind a cockpit of an airplane. You have an idea of the cockpit of the airplane. So there are a lot of things to move, to look at. So this is for sure overloading the visual channel and there are a lot of information probably too much but they work well because they are highly training people to use that system so they assume that people that using that very complex system is high training so they can uh, use that with few error and with no frustration because it's the training, but the interface per se is really, really complex. <coughs> and probably also difficult to simplify or a bad idea to simplify that. But again, uh, obviously using multiple modes may allow to reduce the overloading on the visual channel and thus increase the bandwidth <laughs> or the interaction. You don't have information from the visual channel, but also from other channels. And, but again, you, or you should always remember that multimodal, multimodality is not just about enhancing the existing, the richness of the interaction, but also provide this redundancy that is really useful, not only for universal accessibility, uh, universal design, but in general, because people can get distracted by something, so have multiple the same information, the same important information coming from different sources could be beneficial in some context. And these are two probably more common examples of multimodal interfaces. <clears throat> what are these? Do you know? This one should be easier, probably. This is Siri on the, the macOS. So Siri on the macOS uh, obviously has a vision as a gesture, in the sense that uh, I pressed a button to start the, the vocal interaction, I say, what time is it? <laughs> and uh, there is also hearing, because I say bring, and there is also, it, it speak, and it also receive my speech as an input. So I press a button, and so gesture, I press a button, here. <laughs> gesture, I press a button, then I, I say, what time is it? It, 
it thinks a, lot, a little bit and say with vision all this and also say it's seven is 1701 by voice by synthesizing the voice and this is a cousin of siri a close relative of another mother but a close relative Sorry? No. <laughs> it, it, it may be, probably. No, no, it may be, but no. It's, it's uh, um, an eco some show. Yeah. So the eco, the eco series is the, is the uh, Amazon product for Alexa. Hmm? So you have uh, things without a screen, like the dot, the eco dot. Uh, and things with a screen like the eco show and so this is multimodal again because you have uh, this should be according to the advertisement of amazon uh, an audiobook so uh, alexa read the book and you can also read on screen and also touch the screen to put it in pause Go, da, go, go be, uh, before, go forward, and so change, uh, increase the volume, decrease the volume. You can do all this operation again, multimodal because we have vision and hearing that present the same information. The, the system is reading the book, but you can also read if you look at the screen. Uh, you have gesture because you can touch the screen and perform operation and you can also speech because you can say stop pause Next chapter previous chapter and so on so they are multimodal they uh, that, that one this one especially has some redundancy vision and speech from uh, vision and hearing and also some additional information like gesture and speech and different way to do things you can touch again uh, the screen to increase the volume but you, you can also say uh, alexa increase the volume mm -hmm. so these are two examples of multimodal interfaces um, i think that uh, how many of you have taken a train in the last uh, well except uh, you in the last um, couple of years five years ten years with trenitalia obviously yeah so in the station you have this kiosk with, with the ticket machine you are present the automatic ticket machine in the station in which you can buy a ticket they speak they are not really multimodal but you can uh, buy a ticket from torino to whatever and buy and then it says something uh, please get your ticket please get your ticket and have that uh, validated in a machine and please be aware of teeth that is around you something like that this is all speaking and so you have a visual you have touch and you have speech this is not really this is not redundant because the information that produced by speaking are not also reported on screen but they are multimodal in a sense just to give you an example of something that you you have seen for sure or mostly for sure or next time you go in a train station have a look at that machine um, so this is multimodal to get used to use these different modalities together we obviously need to understand all these modalities hmm? a little bit in detail i, I start saying that uh, we are going to ignore vision because you know yesterday you did a visual design lecture so probably it's enough so uh, we will start with vision special gaze and then we move on so vision again it's important it's a part but we did two months about vision about vision so we can for now avoid giving further detail so uh, uh, the idea here is to give you a very 
brief information on how things work and then present some example of uh, interfaces that use this so as you know we told you i told you before vision is the main source often of information of our information about the words and is a highly complex activity and vision starts in the high as you know that is a mechanism for receiving light from the environment and transforming it into electrical signal that are then processed by our brain in something that we can understand and we can relate and process to. Uh, the eye is composed by several parts, the retina, the papil, the cornea and so on, but they are not really uh, of interest right now. And a part of acting the vision as a in human input we can also use we have seen that video as a gaze so the question we can have is can we control a computer solely with the eyes and the answer we have seen is yes with eye tracking or a gazed interface so with eye tracking interfaces a person gaze can be used to control user interface as we have seen in that video typically through dedicated hardware like an eye tracker so you can detect gaze uh, via also the webcam of your computer but you don't have the precision that you have with dedicated hardware you can roughly arrive to distinguish if you are looking in eight nine different parts of the screen with an eye tracker, you can press a button, two, two close button, quite big, but two close buttons. Mm -hmm. And eye tracking or eye gaze interface are typically used in two application area in general and in human computer interaction in particular. The first one is the one that we have seen in the video to facilitate the interaction for user with disabilities. If I cannot move, I can only, only move my eyes, I can use an eye tracker to control a computer, to communicate with other people, to read information, to receive information, to make some action in the environment. And this is uh, uh, an important yet, let's say, relatively small application area. The other area for which you have seen a picture yesterday during the lecture is to get data to understand the human behavior. Yesterday, Professor Corno showed you a picture or sort of a heat map in which some area are red, other orange, according to where the user is looking. And this is to get data to understand human behavior in general, also not with soft, not software, and also to explore new novel user interface, a sort of evaluation. I created this interface where the user is looking. Is this button put in the right place? Is this modality correct? It works, it works well, not, and so on. Um, and these are three kinds of eye tracker. The first two, in the first let's say, column, are mostly for uh, understanding people, for understanding human behavior. This one here, are instead uh, for people with disabilities. They are more similar product. They are also produced by the same company, but they are the target different uh, customer. So you see that they are different format, different size. For, this, for instance, the first one on the top is a glass. You don't have a screen. You record what people is looking around going uh, to to have grocery so shopping with this glass and you see what people is looking in the supermarket what the people is buying what is saying all these uh, extremely not privacy aware things but th they are that is you can buy them with a, a discrete amount of money and the second one is again for understanding again user it's an eye tracker again with a screen so for 
looking at, at uh, website, at application, like, and it produced the heat maps that you have seen yesterday. These are, again, eye trackers, but for people with disabilities. So for instance, these are, this in the picture, this is a, a tool for augmentative alternate communication. So people maybe that cannot speak, they can select like, I like, uh, something that is not here or, or, or I would like to say stop please stop so I look at this and I select stop and this pronounce for me stop and and this is the a bigger version of that as a screen they are but they are the same product and they works in the same way so a, a night tracker consists basically of cameras projectors and algorithms so people is looking at a certain point on the screen, for instance, and the projector creates a pattern of near infrared light on the eyes to get the pupil, not to get the eyes in this totality, just the pupil of the eyes, where the person is looking at. The eye tracker is also able to understand if you are fixing something or just moving around. So just not the gaze, but also fixation. Um, cameras obviously take high resolution of the image of the user eyes and patterns and then all this is processed with machine learning image processing algorithm mathematical algorithms it depends on the application depends on the context it depends of the the goal of the of the tracking to determine the high position and the gaze point on the screen to know if you are looking at a button or a text for instance, and to behave consequently. And these are, again, example of a tracker interface. The first one is what you have seen yesterday, more or less. This is on mobile, but so in a heat map of where the user, the user is looking. In this application, according to the tracker, the user is mainly looking here and here and a little bit here, never here basically in this white space and this is in a heat map and with the same data you can also have this scan path analysis in which you don't all, only understand where the people is looking so this big circle is because the person is looking more on the Zappos logo but also how it moves his eyes so these lines here so it look here and then here and then here and then back all the path of scanning through the screen and this is for the first application area to get uh, the user behavior with screens obviously um, this is instead uh, an application for controlling this is in windows 10 this is part of windows 10 if you connect an eye tracker or use Windows 10 on a tracker, you get this. And notice that these are bigger buttons just to be used with uh, an a tracker and some other uh, information like, do you want the gaze cursor? So you want that the operating system show you the cursor when you are gazing or just, or not? It depends on preferences. Uh, do you want to show help pop-ups? Yes, in this case they want. And how do you want to activate things so for activation is how do you want to understand if you are clicking something or just looking at with dwell switch or other advanced setting switch is pressing a button so uh, this is needed for the overcoming the midas touch do you know the mid the king midas story yeah no yeah the touch become gold yeah so the problem with the tracking is that you are looking continuously looking at the screen so you, you look at text if you want to use this to select this button you are looking here but if you want to select this you probably look at you know here the help button and then also the play setting and the the software needs a way to understand whether you're just looking through or you really want to click that button 
what here is called activation method. How do you want that the system understand whether you are just reading or you want to perform any action? And Windows provides two ways. One is which. So I'm, lo I'm looking and apply setting and then I press something, a button on the computer, out outside of the computer, no matter. I press a button to select what I was looking or I can use the well. So I can continue fixing for a certain amount of time a button and after, let's say, 10 seconds that I fix, 15 seconds that I fix apply setting, this button is pressed. So if I don't fix anything, I continue to move my gaze around the screen, nothing is selecting, nothing is clicked. Otherwise, I need to continue fixation. This is called meta touch. A solution to middle touch, not the only one. Both are solution to the middle touch. And if you are trained in using eye tracking, eye tracking is extremely rapid. It's much more uh, quick to use a computer through eye tracking than on a window with, with mouse or touch screen because eyes are very quick. Obviously, you have some changes in interfaces, some extra costs of like the camera, infrared lights, and so on. And this, since we skipped uh, vision, close um, the vision part. So, next step is smell and taste. I put them together because uh, you correctly imagine they do not play a role in human-computer interaction, in user interface. You don't smell anything out of your computer, you don't taste your computer, typically. But here we can say that we miss, we in general, in the world, miss a possible opportunity, especially with smell, because we as human beings have around 12 million of factor receptor, and we are able to detect around 10,000 different odors. So really smell could be used for something in a computer system. Maybe not for browsing the web, but in other interactive application it could be. And similarly, we are born with uh, 10,000 taste receptor in our mouth. So we can discriminate quite a lot of different flavors. As human being, both smell and taste provide us with a very important early warning system, unconscious for some way. So if you think about you are at home and you smell something that burns, you immediately say there is something wrong. You don't need something that speech you are going, there is fire in your home. You smell the, that something is burning and you can do something else. You can don't know, escape, for instance. And similarly, if you think a taste, maybe you have some foods that looks good visually, no bad smell, but when you taste it, you say, blah, and you don't eat anymore. So they are early warning system. You don't that avoid us to, I don't know, get catch in a fire or to hit expired food or not food, something that we think was food, but maybe it's not, or poisoned food, or something like that, before we eat a lot of quantity of that. But again, traditionally, they don't play a role in uh, human-computer interaction. So uh, to, to show you two examples, I have to move to human-computer interaction research. And uh, these are two research of uh, our search group, uh, which was this multisensory.info website that is in the UK. Um, that is also, this project is also funded about multisensory interaction by the ERC, that is the European Grant for Younger Searcher. So the person that is investigating this received this prize from the European Union, that is a, lot of, a great amount of money for five years, millions of money for five years, to conduct this research. It is high competitive. So this is, let's say, very uh, high stake for research for according to the perspective of the European Union at least and so they, they do a lot of things about 
multisensory interaction and this is for instance is a prototype of a hincar or factory interaction so they deliver different shent to car drivers to indicate dan danger or point of interest so if you smell something bad probably it's a danger that happens around your car so you can react as an alternative way or an additional way respect to a visual information that in the car is regulated strictly regulated for what concern the driving and uh, a total anarchia for what concern the infotainment system as an additional not really invasive system a shant of something that warn you about uh, a danger or point of interest obviously people need to be trained that that smell is bad and is a danger the other smell is instead positive and they reach if you want here there is the information there is a, a paper in english if you want if not it's fine uh, they reached a good uh, a good results about it it worked you smell and not only visual information and audio information to to do this so this is also an application in a car so something that is an interactive system they also work with food and taste so this is basic research not yet interactive system they basically do this novel system that uses acoustic levitation to deliver food morsel to the user dog so this is a levitator like this and here you have pieces very small pieces of food levitating in the hair and they create this machine they also uh, in, on the website there is also a, a video if you if you are curious they uh, levitate coffee they levitate a micro hamburger so bread uh, mi meat uh, um, latug and another bread and people can uh, heat them on levitating in this machine so this is not yet uh, interaction because you obviously don't really interact with a computer system but it's something that put in connection taste in a different way with humans again also here there is a paper from 2017 so not uh, a lot um, not very very old uh, as a paper and they are still working on this possibility so I I with respect to the, the previous one that was already an interactive system because there are some computer technology this is a little bit earlier but I it's just a, a first step they are readily used almost no use but in some context they are starting to be next touch and gesture so again for touch we mean haptic perception the skin not only the hands or grabbing things that as a human being acts as a mean of feedback and provide us with information about your environment in various form format with touch we have information on shape of things on texture on the resistance on the temperature of a thing and also we can compare special factor of different objects this is bigger than the other this is uh, more mm, this is colder than another the other this is probably dirtier than this and we get this information by touching things and this is opting perception so an input a human input and then we have let's say the human output let's call it that are gesture or hand body mov movement in general that are instead widely used uh, to control and provide inputs to computer especially in virtual reality or games or or if you think about your smartphone you are continuously uh, touching or using some tools for performing operation on your smartphone or your computer mm -hmm. 
So as an example of a haptic interaction, we can have, for instance, the braille display or the braille bar. This is something that you plug on your computer and for people who are blind and uh, they allow people to read braille from the information that you have on your computer. So they exist in various formats, bigger, smaller, and so on. Uh, counted about the, the, the range of character they have. Most common, 30, 32 and 40, but there is also with small, less charter and more charter. And all display needs, obviously, this is also the, a hardware device, a screen reader as a software. So something that reads what is on the screen and pass it through this Braille display or Braille bar so that a user can sense what happens. Or if we again move uh, more about research, but not only, we have for instance this. This is Tesla Touch, is a prototype for Disney from Disney Research in 2010. This is a touch screen, a table, in, powered with electro vibration. And so if you touch this, if you touch the metal, you see, you, you sense like touching the real metal. If you touch the water, whatever it is, the sand, you feel like touching the sand. But this is just a screen. It's a touch screen that uses calibrated electro vibration to provide you that haptic information on a pseudo normal touch screen. This is a touch, it's a table, not uh, a tablet, but the idea is augmenting normal uh, tablets, normal touch surface with sensor and actuator to provide this electro, vibra, uh, electro vibration to give uh, optic feedback when you touch uh, a screen, for instance. Uh, instead for gesture, probably it's easier for you to imagine. Uh, I have here two examples. The first one is the gesture control of brand new BMW car. So in this car, you can control the infotainment system by waving your hand in front of it. Um, and this is made with a camera. And then you also have things like the lip motion that are nowadays used for virtual reality for tracking and in virtual environment context. And this is also via camera. Other type of gesture, and then we will stop here. Other type of gesture are not uh, via camera, but can also be via, for instance, radar based system. So that, that, this one is the Pixel 4 phone by Google. I don't want to advertise uh, companies, but uh, if they do something uh, pertinent uh, that uses that is a component it is a motion sense that allow you to skip music going to, to the, go forward backward typically with music and with other few application by moving the hand on top of the phone in front of the phone and this is not made by camera like for instance the the car system but with a radar like normal radar in uh, for flights for instance and this is in the commercial version of a project that started a lot of years some years ago that is called soli by the google advanced technology and project there's a group inside google to perform new things and soli is a miniature radar let's say around one centimeter as a chip very very small that was thought to be put inside smart watches that understand human motion at very scale, not only simple gesture like the one, the pixel, but it can do a lot of more than this. And it's powered obviously by machine learning to understand which gesture, which gesture you are performing. Um, so the basic behavior is that you have a gesture, you get the raw signal, transform the signal, classify the gesture according to to what you, you did, what the radar detects in front of the object, and then it behaves consequently as, um, as expected, hopefully. Hmm? Okay, 
So, before having lunch, just a couple of news slash reminders. Tomorrow we will not have the lab. Uh, however, next week we will have three hours of the lab because we need to, to take into account the one hour left tomorrow. So, no lab tomorrow. Feel free to use your morning as you want. Uh, next week we will have three hours. In uh, a way to use your morning as you want, the milestone number two is due tomorrow, end of the day. Uh, milestone number three will be published probably tomorrow or the day after, just after you submit the milestone two. And uh, you can work on it during the lab of the 21. So next week you can have, let's say three hours, maybe less, but that lab to work on milestone number three. That will be about uh, a wireframe and uh, a skeleton of a user interface in HTML and the deadline to then submit the milestone number three is the 28th of November and this put in a pause milestone up to the end of the course when we have milestone number four that is the user evaluation of your prototype so after the let's say 21, 28 most of the lab will be devoted to uh, what we call the supervised work group. So you working on your project, supervised by me, basically. Hmm? Okay, next week we will continue with this slide, the other slide, and we will start speaking about voice-based interaction also from a technical point of view. Have a good lunch. <laughs>